so there's a few things that I want to address with with this problem. There's several things we can talk about. The first one is uh, on this side, on the right side. How would I go about it, kind of cleaning this up a bit? Okay, distribute a negative one. Okay, so what I want to point out is that we don't distribute that 4. And the 4 does not get distributed. Why doesn't the 4 get distributed? Now the, it's not multiplied by the parentheses, man. It's pretty much the simplest way to put it. It's not the number that is you know, immediately next to the parentheses and therefore supposed to be multiplied by the parentheses. We only distribute when we're multiplying and 4 is not multiplied by the parentheses. Okay? So that will be the first thing. So a few of you have that mistake. Um, and we change this to a negative, and we can talk about a little mistake there. So let's distribute the negative. We get negative x. And remember, negative times negative is positive. So we have a negative times negative 3 is positive. So careful with that. When you distribute negatives, make sure that when there's a negative, you know, the negatives cancel each other out. Uh, so we distribute this guy here. All right, so we got like that. Uh, let's go to here. Uh, let's say, here, let me just kind of playing around with it. Let's, let's say this was a 4x, okay? And let's say for, for whatever reason I decide I'm going to subtract 10x, okay? So far so good, nothing that has happened yet. Okay, but I've seen this a couple times. You see the x's and you want to subtract it from both of the x's, but you shouldn't. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of people making this kind of mistake, but a few, and I just wanted to address it. Um, just be careful about that. What, what are we subtracting on this side? What are we subtracting here? 20. So we're subtracting 20x if we subtract 10x. Twice. Okay. Let's back up. Because here's another thing that happens. Uh, I'll, I'll go to add x. Great idea. Right? Cancel it out. All that kind of stuff. And you would expect to add it to the other side, but I'll see this. Okay. Because, like, you're thinking, you're just getting kind of confused, I think. That you're supposed to do the same thing on both sides. Uh, you see a negative x, so you're supposed to add the x. Uh, makes sense. But then you just wind up adding it twice on one side, not to both sides. So be careful about that. All you've done here is added 2x to this side and nothing to this side. So it, you know, the equation is off balance. So be careful of that. You can either add x to both sides and then subtract 4x from both sides, or you can combine these guys here and get 3x plus 3 on this side, 10x plus about that. Keep an eye out for that. Something I've seen. Um, something else I've seen in this kind of situation, like once it gets down to this level, uh, something like this. You'll do minus 3x, minus 3x. And at the same time, you'll think, well, I don't want to write this down, and then deal with the constants after that, so I'll go ahead and deal with the constants. So you'll do this. Right. Some of you may see why we shouldn't do this. I mean, we can't do that. Is anything wrong? Have we done anything incorrect? No. Maybe not like the best idea. Um, because, well, we've done the same thing to both sides. And as long as we do that, that's all right. But the mistake happens with like a faulty assumption that happens next. What do we do? Like, let's just make sure we combine everything exactly as it says. 10x minus 3x is 7x. 15 minus 3, that's 12. 3x minus 3x minus 3x is zero, and 3 minus 3 is zero. So on this side, there's a zero. Okay, so be careful of that. See, the thing that happens a lot is that people will get 7x plus 12. Don't even recognize that there's another side of the equation that they're ignoring, and then kind of treat like like this is the equation. Then divide by seven, and x is positive 12 sevenths. So it shouldn't be that way. Uh, ideally, I would think that you would. You would maybe subtract 3x from both sides, subtract 15 from both sides, and now you've got variables on one side, you got numbers on the other. 
Uh, but this is true as well. This is just as true as anything else you might write down. But we're gonna have to go ahead and subtract 12 from both sides. And negative 12 divided by seven. X is negative 12 sevenths. Just be careful about that. Next, let's talk about this thing we're doing here. Two fourths of X minus this side. Making up an equation here. I'm about to graph this incorrectly. And I want I'm going to talk to you about it. So I'm going to pretend I'm a person who is like, oh, right slope intercept form, so I'm going to do the slope, and I'm going to do the intercept, and I'm going to graph this line. So I'm like this. All right, so I got that guy there. Uh, and then I go like this. All right. Is that correct? No. What mistake does this person make? the rise and the run. That might seem like a really simple, innocent mistake, where it's like, eh, I just forgot. But that's the problem. That's a much bigger problem than you might think. You might think I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but I'm not. I know what I'm talking about. If you're graphing the line incorrectly because you flipped the rise and the run around, then I can guarantee you something. You're relying on the shortcut to graph things. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You realize that, that putting the point on the y on the y-axis and then doing a slope, that's that's a shortcut. Right? Does that agree? That's a shortcut. That's not really graphing, it's a shortcut to getting the graph quickly so that we don't have to bother with something that would take longer. And that's a great idea to have shortcuts, but if you don't understand the shortcut, then you're really setting yourself up for difficulty in the future, okay? If it was just you momentarily forgot, okay, and, and if I asked you to tell me why that was a mistake and you could explain it in a way that shows you really understand what a graph is, that's fine, uh, so you just kinda overlooked that, but if, if we've really been paying attention, we've really been plotting points, as have been, been asking you to plot points, plugging things in for X and getting the things out for Y, um, this isn't a mistake that we would be making. Um, so yeah, don't, don't put yourself in a position where you are getting questions wrong because you are not memorizing you know what I'm saying? Math and, uh, and, and so many things in life are not about memorization. Uh, they're about learning. Learning is understanding, not just memorizing steps. Can we break this down into steps? Sure, we, we could. We could say, go on the y-axis to this place, right? On the y-axis, put a point. Go up this much and over this much. Uh, and that will work, but later, when we draw graphs of more complicated functions, and we don't understand that a graph is a bunch of points, and each point represents an input and output, or put another way, a solution to the equation, if we don't know that, if we don't understand that, if we're not grasping that, then the transition from graphing lines to graphing parabolas is gonna be, is gonna seem like jumping over the Grand Canyon, because they're gonna seem so unrelated to each other. It's gonna seem like, oh, here's this new set of steps I have to remember to graph a parabola. It doesn't have to be that way. Right? If we remember that the graph is a bunch of points and we know how to find those points, going falling back on that understanding is, is much better than saying, oh, you flipped the rise and the run. Well, that doesn't mean no good later on in life, okay? Or later on in this class. So let's just back up to this first point right here. And we're like talk about it again why it is we know that there's a point there. Based on this equation, how do I know there's gonna be a point there on the y-axis? Not just because there's a negative five there, no, not because I know the shortcut. I want you to tell me exactly why you know there's a point on the y-axis right there. 
Yeah. But how does the how does the equation tell me that? Like that's the y-intercept. There should be a point on the y-axis at negative five. So when x is zero, yeah. I think that's where you were going. When x is zero, you get out negative five. That is the foundation. That is the basis, and it's so simple. It's a simple foundation, but if you ignore it, it's going to make things difficult in the future. But the point is, if I put in zero for x, I get out negative five. Okay. Now, after I've graphed a hundred of these. And I start to notice, I don't need to be plugging in 0 for x. I know what's going to happen when I do that. I'm going to just be left over with this. But we want to make that conclusion. We want to notice that pattern. We don't want to just rely on that pattern. And that's all we know about graphing, is I know that this means go to that point on the y-axis and then do this next step, step number two. If they have no meaning, then it's not very helpful. Right? So, we plug in 0 for x, and we get negative 5 for y. That's just the easiest thing we could possibly plug in for x. It's so obvious that if we plug in 0 for x, we'll get negative 5 for y. So rather than following the slope and hoping that I remembered it correctly, that I'm a good memorizer, let's talk about what would the next easiest point be to find. Like, what would the next easiest thing be to plug in for x? When do you think one would be the next easiest? Four would be back. You jump from one to four. You didn't go to two or three. Why four? Because it's the denominator, and if we if we multiply three fourths by four, the denominator will be canceled out. What do we have then? No fractions. There are no common denominators to find and add things together. No fractions to graph on the graph. Right? It's all whole numbers, and that's the best, easiest thing. So do I have to remember that this is the run and this is the rise? No, I, I just recognize that the next x that I want to go to is 4, because 4 is going to cancel this 4. And the next x I would want to go to after that would be 8, because that would be the next number that would cancel this denominator. Not uh, 6, and not 7, and not 5, 8. I want to go over 8. Okay? And not 1, and not 2, and not 3, but 4. 4 cancels this denominator of 4. So every multiple of 4, that's what I want to plug in for x. Cancels out. So there's the over four part. That's the ru the run part of it. Okay. And look at that. Well, there's there's that negative five that I got for the y-intercept, right? Where I'm going to go from there? I'm going to add three to that. I'm going to come up three. I'm going to rise three. Okay? So that's going to be negative two. If I move over to x is four, when I plug x is four into this equation, I cancel out the denominator. I don't have any fractions to deal with. And when I do that, I don't have any fractions to deal with. I just wind up adding 3 to negative 5. If I go to 8, if I go to x is 8, then I bet what will happen, when I plug 8 in there, I'll still cancel this denominator of 4, because I still have a common factor of 4. But now that's 2 times 3, not 1 times 3. So now it's 6 plus negative 5. So that's just 3 more than negative 2. I add 3 to this, and I get positive 1. And now it's occurring to me how that's it. That's what the rise over the run is all about. Every x that I move over, right, every multiple of the denominator that I plug in for x, that would be the next time, the next x value that will give me a y that's not a fraction, a y that is just a whole number. And it'll work for, it'll work in the other directions too, but we'll just be subtracting 3, because now you plugging in negative numbers and getting negative numbers and subtracting numbers from negative 5. If I go to negative 4, I won't go up 3, I'll go down 3. So compared to this guy, I'll go down 3 from here, so I'll get negative 8. I can't make you not use the y-intercept and the slope as the way that you know how to graph lines. I can't make you do it. I can't stop you. I'm not going to mark you wrong uh, for graphing it correctly, but using a shortcut that you don't understand. I, I can't even know if that's true or not. If you graph the line correctly, 
It's correct. Right? When it comes time for other complicated functions with more difficult uh, graphs to graph, understanding input and output, and why it is we're finding these key points, and how it is that we can find them the way that we find them, I mean, that's going to be much easier on you than I know this step one and step two for lines. I know step one, two, and three for parabolas. I know steps one through five for other polynomials. I know, you know all the right steps. People who are successful in mathematics or any field are not good at that thing or successful in that thing because they have memorized all the stuff and all the formulas. Because they understand what's going on. They understand what a graph is. They, they have a deeper understanding. Okay, let's try this again. So. You can write on your quizzes or get out your notes or something, but why don't you grab something to write on? Okay, so we want to choose the easiest, we want to make life easy on ourselves, so we want to choose the easiest values for x that we can. So what's the easiest one? Nine. Zero. Zero. Easier than nine is zero, and then the next would be nine. Okay, uh, so because zero is the easiest, the y-intercept is a point that we can find really easily, really, really quickly. Right? We know that when we plug in zero, we're going to subtract three from zero, and we're just going to be left with negative three. That's true of every equation that looks like this, mx plus b. That b is hanging out there by itself. If you plug in zero for x, that x term is going to get eliminated, and b is the only thing left. That's why we just say, oh, it's the y-intercept, because that's what you get when you plug in zero. Negative three. Why do we immediately jump over a run of nine? Because, well, x is nine. We'll cancel out the denominator. Okay, so let's just do this math real quick. So we want to make sure we don't make any mistakes. Nines cancel. Four minus three, one. Okay. Um, so let's look at those two points. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three nine. One, and we graph one. Plotting the y-intercept and then following the slope is just a way to find those two points really quickly because we have noticed this pattern shows up for every y equals mx plus b form of a linear equation. It's easy to see that if we plug in zero, we get negative three, so that's why we put the y-intercept there. Look what happens when I go rise of four and run of nine. One, two, three, four. Nine. Just puts me on that point that I know I'll get when I plug in 9 for x. It's not magic. It's not anything you have to memorize. You don't have to come up with any tricks. You don't need a cheat sheet. Just know that you're plugging in values for x and getting values for y. You want to jump over to x is 9 rather than doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8 because anything 1 through 8 is going to give me some fraction that I have to graph. Plug in 2. I get some ninths, I'm going to have to find a common denominator, so I can subtract 3 from that. Then I have to graph that fraction, and it's not going to be very accurate. The best, easiest, most accurate way that I could do it would be to find the next one that's right on the grid. Or on the, on the quiz there, you see there's those dots that are just right there, you know, at the intersection of two whole numbers. I want to find those dots, I want to find those points. And then I can draw all the other points by connecting. How many points did I draw when I did this? All of them. All of them. How many? Infinite number, yeah. Well, at least all the ones that I can fit in this window. I can't go on for eternity in both directions. This is not realistic. All right. So if in doubt, ever, for any graph at all, plug in an x and get out a y. If you stay at that level for the rest of your life, you'll be in much better shape than the person who can find it by the shortcuts. They don't have any idea what the graph means. Okay. So there's that. Always plot points. Always plot points. So those two lines, are those two lines parallel? Okay, so there's nothing to say that there are, so there's, there's also nothing to say that they aren't, right? 
So if we just say, well, we can't really be sure. We can't be sure by a picture that these lines are parallel or perpendicular or neither, right? I guess I could tell pretty well that they're not perpendicular. But there's just not enough evidence to show that they're parallel. We need hard evidence, proof, that they are parallel or perpendicular or neither. If these two lines are parallel, what is the an arguable proof that they are parallel? Their slopes are equal. Exactly. Like we need a quantifiable, measurable, right? all these things mean a number, some number that I can compare to some other number and draw some kind of a conclusion. So the slope, that's a good number because the slope tells me how slopey the line is, right? And if two lines are the same slopiness, then they're never going to touch each other, and so they're parallel. So we need the same slopes. A, a picture, and unless you plot the points and then count the slope off, all right, I guess that would tell you the slope. But until you find the number that is the slope, you can't say anything about how these lines are related to each other as far as parallel or perpendicular. How about if the two lines are perpendicular, how do we use their slopes to prove that? Slopes are opposite reciprocals. Gotta be opposite reciprocals. You have to find the slopes. If we don't find the slopes, we can't know either of these things for sure. We can make guesses, but lucky guesses are not proof of understanding, and that's what we're looking for. Right. Certainly, drawing lines and making a guess is better than doing nothing. It, it shows that you understand. <laughs> kind of what parallel looks like and what perpendicular kind of looks like. So there's, there's that understanding, but I'm looking for can you prove it one way or the other. Right. So if that's the case, now we know that, okay, that they need to be the same or opposite reciprocals in order to conclude one or the other. And it just becomes, do we know how to find the slope? If we don't have, know how to find the slope, it would be not very useful to know that this is what we need to find, that they're the same or that they're opposite reciprocals. So let's, I won't do one where we try to figure out if they're parallel or perpendicular. Because once you can find the slope, you can decide whether two numbers are exactly the same as each other or if they're opposite reciprocals. It's not that big a deal. So let's just throw two points out there. I want you to find the slope, but after I re-explain it. Okay, it's true that the slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay. But it's not magic, it's not a formula that we necessarily have to memorize correctly. Here is a point, and here is a point. Here's the second point, and this is the first point. What's the slope? It's this guy right here. The slope between two points, that's it. So we're looking for the vertical and the horizontal. Horizontal. Okay, vertical and horizontal. Or rise and run. Or what I like, which is much more mathematical, which is it's not a handy little thing to help you remember something. It is what is going on, which is what these values are. It's the change in y. How much did y change from this point to this point? Does that make sense? How much did y change? If we go back to this graph over here, when I do this rise of 4, I'm just saying from this point to this point, y changed positive 4. Right? Change in y. And change in x. How much did x change between this point and this point? That's what we're looking for. So rise over 1 becomes the change in y or the change in x, delta y over delta x. Remember, delta is just a, a brief letter that means the change, the change in y. This less cluttered looking. Okay, we're looking for this vertical change, this horizontal change. I know what what the 
this y value is right here. And what this y value is, well, we'll call this the y value for 2 and the y value for 1. What I want is this guy right here. Well, that's just y2 when I take y1 away from it. So that'll give me the vertical change. That'll work for any two points, any vertical change that I want to find. Just take the y of one point and the y of the other point and do some subtraction. Now if I want to know this horizontal change, I can take this x value. That would be the x value of the second point. And I can take this x value. That's the x value of the first point. And then just take the first value from the second value. And that gives me a horizontal change, the change in x. That's, this is quite straightforwardly what this is calculating, the change in y and the change in x. I just want to take a few moments, uh, unless there's any questions about that. Do you ever feel like explanations are good enough or clear enough or anything like that. you got to ask a question that help me clarify it for you because to me this seems really clear, right? Of course I'm judging it on my own standards. Judge it on your own standards. Let me know if it's not clear. So if I start with negative 9, I want to figure out how much does the y change between this point and this point, just take the negative 9, that's this y value, minus, sorry, negative 3, minus negative 3. I'm going to find how much the, the x changes, then I'll take negative 5. Okay, it's really important that these be from the same point, that be from the same point, uh, minus you might take a little experimenting and practicing and trying different combinations of points to convince yourself. But even with all these negatives and subtraction, it all still works out. So negative 9 plus 3 is negative 6. Negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7. Negative divided by negative is positive. Six sevenths is the, uh, is the slope. Six sevenths. I have uh, two other points, some other line, and I find their slope, the slope between those two points, and it comes out to be six sevenths, and those lines must be parallel. And if I find the slope and I decide that they're perpendicular, that means that the other slope would have to be what? Negative seven over six. going to use this exactly the same problem from the test. About it. So fork it again. Let's see. It makes a little more sense. Uh, I'm going to start with like the number one tried thing. This, let me say. Divide by rt. Well, this is going to turn out to be, I mean, we can do this. Absolutely, you can divide both sides by RT, but you just have to do it correctly. And if you divide it by RT, then I'm sure you thought something should happen that doesn't happen, that it's not true, it's not possible. Okay. Now, this is a little bit better than, than something else I was seeing, which is, like, just divide this by RT. Well, that's, that's clearly not correct. Why? We have to divide everything else. Yeah, we've got to divide both sides by the same thing. So if I divide this side by RT, I've got to divide the entire right side by RT. So we've established that well, that P has to be included in the division. So what a, a person who's done this is hoping will happen is that these RTs will cancel. Maybe they do, right? Maybe. Then we need to investigate. We need to be able to prove it mathematically that it does things left. And this goes back to stuff that we were covering the first few weeks of, of school this year. And that was a, you know, sort of review stuff. And part of that was simplifying fractions. This is a fraction. 
is it possible to simplify it so that it is p plus p, like the person is, is wishing that it would be? Yeah. Well, no, not p plus p, but it could be p over r c plus p. It would be. So let's look at well, let's look at that in a couple of different ways. First, is it possible to cancel the r t line? Is it possible for a factor of r t in the numerator to cancel a factor of r t in the denominator? Remember, we're looking for common factors to cancel. We do it well when it's numbers, right? When we're simplifying 25 over 35, we recognize that there's a common factor of 5, we cancel it out, and you know, everything's great. When it comes to letters and stuff, we forget what we're actually doing. We're actually looking for a factor of RT to, fac to cancel a factor of RT. Factor means I can multiply it by something, right? 3 is a factor of 15 because 3 times 5 is 15. So if I can cancel out an RT, from the denominator, it means I can write RT times something is the denominator. Right. So one way to, to make that pretty clear is I should be able to write some other fractions. So if I multiply these fractions together, I get the original fraction back. Can I put something down here that will give me the, the original denominator? RT times 1. That'll work. When I, when I look at RT and I know, I know I'm going to multiply it by this numerator, and I look at the numerator I'm supposed to get, I can see there's like supposed to be some distribution, right? I should recognize that. I'm going to have to multiply it by something here and something here. Let's start with the second one. What can I put here so that RT times this is PRT? P. Everything's looking good. We're like one more thing. We've got two out of three things that we need. But when I go to multiply RT by this, is there something that's simpler than that that I can multiply RT by to get just P? RT times something just gives me P. Anything simpler? Anything nice and good looking? No, there does, does of course exist something that works. But what is that something that we would have to multiply by? Over P over RT. Over RT. Now it's true, but it's not very nice and neat. And when it comes to getting P by itself, This doesn't look a whole lot better than this did. It's trying to get P by itself. Okay. So, so that's a way you could go, and we could proceed from there, and we could eventually get P by itself. It would just be kind of a roundabout way. Right? It'd be kind of like getting on this road out here and going down to IGA to just turn left and go to Missoula. Just a little bit roundabout, we would get there, but we took the long way around. So let's take a more straightforward approach. Backing this up. Moving this out of the way. Before we get too far into what would be the fastest way, the most straightforward way, I just want to remind you about something. Let's say I wanted to solve for x. Right? I can put this in a simple equation, a more complicated equation. But I guarantee that uh, most often, when we solve these equations, it comes down to something like this. You got x on this side, multiplied by something. Okay, the squiggly just represents something that we're multiplying by x. It might be 5, it might be 3, it might be 12. It might be something more complicated than just this, this plain old number. Right? Equals, you know, some stuff. Whatever. This it could be a bunch of stuff over here, it doesn't really matter. Like this could be as crazy looking as possible, this could be as crazy looking as possible. But universally, to get x by itself at this point, all we're trying to do is get x by itself. Doesn't matter how ugly this side might look. What would we do to get x by itself? Divide by that. Divide by the by the thing. It's multiplied by x. Whether it be a number or a big old thing in parentheses, we just divide by that thing. Divide by that thing. Right? Because Division is the inverse of multiplication. We want to cancel out multiplication by a thing, so we divide by that thing. Is that making sense? Am I confusing you with squiggles? You're good? Okay. So we divide both sides by the thing, and the stuff divided by the thing is x. Okay. Like almost every time, am I right? Mm -hmm. Almost every time we solve for x or y or whatever, we wind up with something times x equals some other stuff. And then we divide by the something. So, that's our goal here. Uh, almost every time we solve for x or p or y or whatever, we'd like to get to the point where we have p 
P in this case times something equals well let's say it equals A. Let's see if we can just kind of rewrite this side and just kind of switch sides and then now I can make it different. Now is that possible? Can we take P and it can, like, can we fill in this parentheses so that P times this parentheses equals that? One plus R T. One plus R T. Let's check that out as a theory. How do I multiply P by this parentheses? So I distribute the P to the 1, I get P. Multi multiply the P by the RT, I get PRT. So they are equivalent. Okay. Now, that happens to be really helpful because now we have something times P equals, well, A in this case, which doesn't really matter. So what are we going to do to get rid of this 1 plus RT? Just divide by that thing. If it was a 3, we divide by 3. If it was a 5, we divide by 3. If it was 175, we divide by 175. It's not any of those things. It's 1 plus RT. That's the thing that's multiplied by T. So we'll cancel it out by dividing. So now the numerator and denominator do have a common factor of 1 plus RT. Just like they would have a common factor of 5 or 3 or 2 or whatever when we divide. So now P is equal to a over 1 plus rt. I don't really have to worry about trying to make this look better than it does. They're simplifying it in some way. It doesn't even seem like there's any hope of simplifying it because you got rt, a, 1, like nothing seems to be like maybe in common. It's just no hope. So that's it. It's kind of ugly, but that's exactly what p is equal to. Right. How do we multiply p by this parentheses again? Distribution. So to get this to look like this, we do distribution. Sometimes distribution is a helpful thing to do. Like in this case, back here, the first thing we did, distribution was a helpful thing to do. We distribute the five, we distribute the negative. Right? It helps us to get x by itself. Here, we want to do the reverse. We want to do exactly the opposite of distribution. What's the opposite of distribution go? Up? We go that direction. Undistribution. Undistribution and factoring, the exact same idea. Right? Unfactoring seems more like, well, that makes sense. Like the nomenclature of that makes sense. This is distribution, opposite of distribution. You put an un in front of it, undistribution. But the word is factoring. Okay? And in this case, we factored out. Both of these have a factor of P. We take that factor out so that if we distributed it back in, it would find it the same. So the idea of factoring something out to solve an equation for a certain variable is one we will use a lot. Not only will we factor out single factors, we'll factor out other factors that look like this. That's much later, though. So. Doing things like trying to divide by RT and hoping that RT cancels RT, that doesn't work, we showed that. Uh, doing P equals A minus PRT. The, you know, your intentions here are good. You're getting P by itself. There certainly is a P by itself on this side. But the idea is that with, like with this, if I know what A and R and T are, I can plug all those in, and now I know what P is, right? If I told you that A is 5, R is 7, and T is 12, you can plug them in and figure out what P is worth. Come over here. If I told you what A and R and T were, does that tell you what P is? If I told you what A and R and T were, and you plugged them in, would that say that P is like five? Would it? So I can tell you that A is equal to three, R is equal to one, and T is equal to four. You plug all those in, is that going to get you down to where P is equal to something? We have like some further solving to do. Yeah. Uh, but it wouldn't wind up just saying, like, well, P is equal to the stuff you just did. I would still have to solve for P. P is unknown still. Right? And if you really think about it, if I, if I want to just plug stuff into this side and have it tell me what P is, you know what else I need to know? I need to know what P is before I can figure out what P is. Right? But then that kind of defeats the purpose. Right? So 
factoring out a P, factoring out an X, a Y, or whatever. Think about that. It's a possibility when you're solving. Okay. Last thing is just a quick restatement of what I said the other day when we were learning the solving equations. You've got to give up guessing and checking. You have to give it up. Okay. Leave it on this quiz. If you're a guesser and a checker, it was probably a, an equation that was too hard for you to guess the right answer. Guess the wrong answer. Guessing and checking is a great place to start because it reminds us that what we're looking for is x, you know, or y. If I find it and I can plug it into the equation, then and it's true, then I know I found the solution. But going at it that way, like that's the way you find a solution, it runs out of steam really, really fast. Especially, like I said before, if I give you something like this. find the solutions to, to that equation. You're not going to guess it. I don't, even, I don't know what the solutions are. I didn't make it up so that the solutions were easy. The solutions probably aren't easy. They're probably some weird square root of some off number that is way out of the left field. So we're going to get to the point where solving these is, is not that complicated. We have to start by breaking ourselves of the guessing and checking shackles. Right? If you chain yourself to the guessing and checking as the way you find solutions, just going to be stuck solving really simple linear equations and not being able to move beyond that. Right? I'm happy to help. If you need to get together outside of class, I would love to do that. Uh, or you know, just ask really inquisitive questions during class. you got to break free of the guessing and checking mentality. Right? Uh, and it's something I say every year to every Algebra 2 class. It's not just this group of people. All right, um, you've been very patient with me and listening and taking notes and participating. So let's take a little break before we move on. So I just want to learn a little something new. It would be, um, if, I, if I had my way, we would, we would get through uh, 1.6 and 2.8, I think, and that would be inequalities like uh, inequalities in one variable and then inequalities in two variables, basically. Okay. We'll probably get through one variable and maybe start two variables, realistically. So let's remind ourselves what it means to say that x is greater than negative 5, or x is less than something, or whatever. Like whatever we choose it to be. What's different from saying that x is equal to negative 5, right? That's definitive, that's one value that x can be, and I can see it, and I can kind of conceptualize what x is. Right? But here, x isn't a thing, right? Does that make sense? It's not one thing. It's not one number. What is it? So what is x? Any greater than negative 5. Any number that's greater than negative 5. It's, uh, it's a range of numbers. It's numbers from here to here. Right? Only in this case, it's from negative 5 to infinity, which isn't place that we can arrive at and achieve. But whatever x is, as long as we plug that value in for x and this statement is true, that's what x can be. So it could be an infinite number of things. It's kind of a thing. And so the only way to really kind of visualize it, conceptualize it, is to show it on a graph. Right? So who here has graphed inequalities on a number? Not everybody? Uh, okay. All right, yeah. So let's let's review it really quickly. So I've I've come to negative five, I've put my zero there. Uh, I've put this open circle around negative five. Why is that? Is that greater or equal to? It can't be equal to negative five, right? It can be negative four, agreed? Yeah. Negative four and a half. Negative four point nine. Yeah. Four point nine nine nine. Negative four point, well, let's say not an infinite number of nines, but as many finite number of nines that you want to go to. Yeah. Actually, whether you believe it or not, four point nine forever would actually be negative five. Right? So nines actually went on for eternity. The same thing as negative 5. So 
I won't say an infinite number of nines, but as many number nines as you want to go to and actually stop at the last nine, then, well, we're not quite to negative five, and so x can be all those things, right? But once we go just a little too far, just a little bit past 4.999999, it's going to be to negative five. Now, this won't be true. Let me plug in negative five, right? Because negative five bigger than negative five? So we put that open circle there to just communicate, don't go to negative five, but go as close as you want to negative five, as long as you're bigger than that. So that's really just a quick recap of stuff that I'm sure we've already been exposed to. Um, Let's mess around with this a little bit. Let's not just say that x is greater than something or less than something. Let's say, I'll ask you this. Is it possible for x to be bigger than negative 3 and, and we'll, we'll just concentrate here as a, a word and. This is what we'll tell you if this is possible or not. Can x be greater than negative 3 and x be less than 2? Yeah. Say yes. What well, we confirm that this is true, that this is possible. What could x be? Negative two. Anything from one to negative two. Anything from one to negative two. Anything from negative two. Why do you say one to negative two? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, couldn't it be one point five? Right, or oh, 1.9, so you kind of cut yourself off short. So from negative 2.9999999999 up to 1.9999999999 to 1.9999999. Okay, so let's contrast it with something else. Let's let's say, is it possible for x to be less than negative 2 and x greater than 5? can't be both at the same time. Is there another word we could use? Or. It can be this or that. It can't be both. This can be both. Because if x is a 0, then it's true for both. But if x is, uh, if it's true here, like negative 3, well, it doesn't work over here. Uh, negative 3 is not bigger than 5. So it doesn't work in both. So it's not and, but or. Okay? So this is what we call an and compound inequality, and this is what we call an or compound inequality to multiply. Just wrote it so you can just imagine that over again. When we graph this, it becomes even more clear why x can't be both of these, but it can be both of these. Here's negative 3, 2, 1, 0, 2. I come to negative 3. Here, let's throw that out there. What do I put at negative 3? Open circle open circle saying get as close as you want to negative 3, but you can actually be negative 3. This way we get to 2 and we put what? Close. A close one because it is okay for x to be 2 because it can be equal to 2. Look at that. I mean, it's just in between two numbers. Anything in here is okay. If I pick this number, it works. It's bigger than negative 3 and it's smaller than 2. But if you graph this one, negative 2, 0, Five, and we come to negative two, we put an open circle. At five, we put an open circle. It has to be less than negative two, or it has to be bigger than five. It can't be less than negative two and bigger than five. See here, it's sandwiched between two values. Here, it's either on this side or on this side. One or the other. Thank you.
basically, uh, let me put a graph up there. You go the other way. And just write, write for me an inequality. this inequality you read? Um, X is greater than or equal to negative 7, and X is less than equal to negative 7. And, all right, Matthew, go ahead. How about this? Uh, you know, I, I would like to make, it's not a very good joke, but it's a joke that math, a mathematician is, a, is a, a thing that wants to use as little ink as possible. And so if we could write this with less ink, then, then we're on our way to becoming mathematicians. So could I write it maybe like, negative seven is the smallest that x can be, 12 is the biggest, and so x needs to be less than 12. Well, less than 12, not less than or equal to 12. Yeah, there's there, there's that. there you go. Flipped the, the yeah, you flipped them the wrong way. <laughs> What's that? Because negative the arrow is no, he, no, no, that's right. No, he did it. That's right. Because x is now the middle. Yeah, so you have to flip. So yeah, X is over here. So X is still, you know, being eaten by the alligator or whatever you want to remind yourself of that. To me, I mean, the bigger side of the sign is on the bigger side of the, the value that's bigger. That just seems to make sense. Kind of. So, what? X is bigger than negative seven, uh, but it's also less than 12, right? 12 is bigger than X, X is bigger than negative seven, negative seven is less than or equal to X. And that, kind of in the same way that we graph it, we just kind of sandwich it between two things. But if I do something like this, uh, three, five, open that, close this one, shape it this way, then could I say that uh, x is, uh, well, it needs to be less than, strictly less than negative three, uh, but bigger than or equal to five. Yeah, it's more, it's or, and so it's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have it between two values when it's not actually between them. It's on the left of one of them and to the right of the other one, and it's misleading. And also, if I choose a number that, that works, like a negative six, let's say that's negative six, and I try to put that right there, it doesn't work. It's true for one side and not for the other. It's true here. But then when I look at this part, it's false. So it's going to be a comma. It's got it's well like or right. We we have we cannot uh, save ink. Can't save ink. Yeah, such a waste. We shouldn't even do it anymore. In this case, n no number. Any number that's less than negative three is not also bigger than five. Right? It can't be both at the same time. This is a good question. Yeah, done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's, I should make it clear, we shouldn't do that, we should, we need to say or, it's just the only way to do it. Or comma, or is it or? Comma, sure, comma, we'll say ink. It's a list of, of things that are true about x, so we separate lists with or, uh, commas, that's the word. <laughs> Now let's talk about solving inequalities. Okay, it's different from solving equations, just but barely, barely different from solving equations. Because we're not saying that both sides are equal, we're saying that this thing is not balanced, that one side is bigger than the other side. But then we want to maintain that, that truth. So if I say that uh, 5x minus 2 is greater than uh, what, uh, 8, Bigger than eight. Can you? I mean, you might say, well, just add two to both sides, divide by five on both sides, right? But it's not an equation. So, can you maybe add two to eight, and then you would divide it by five, but then you would turn the thing around. What is that? That's, that's the rule. Can you help me understand why I would do that? That's, what, that's how it is. <laughs> okay, first of all, it's not how it is. You're wrong. 
We don't flip it unless it's a negative. Well, he's saying when you divide by five, you would have to flip this. So yeah. But it's when you divide, right? It's divided by. It is when you divide by a negative. By a negative. That's the only time you have to flip it. All right, but hold on. You know, if I think of an equation as a set of scales. You know, that has to stay balanced. We talked about this before. Then I, if I want it to stay balanced, I need to, when I take one off of this side, well, I gotta take one off of this side so it stays balanced. But this isn't balanced. So it's still, I mean, can you still make me feel better about doing the same thing to both sides even though it's not balanced? Like you can make sure if it's, it should be, and you have to keep it like that. Oh, so it's it's off. Like yeah. it starts off being off. Yeah, and you have to keep it off. We have to be sure that it stays off. Yeah. Like we don't even want it to be equal, right? So we want to make sure that, it, that, the, that the same relationship stays true. This side's bigger than this side. So we want to make sure this is as much bigger than this side as it started. Does that make sense? Then I need to do the same thing on this side. So if I take one from here, well here, I'll take one from here. Well, now it's balanced. I didn't want that. I want it to be unbalanced, so I need to take the one off of this side so that this is still just as much bigger as it was to start with. So same thing to both sides. Still works. You know it's an inequality. You probably never even thought to ask that. But it's a good question to ask. Okay. It's not an equation. The equation thing makes sense to do the same thing to both sides, but pretty much by the same reasoning. Yeah, if it's, an, if it's an inequality, it's okay to just do the, the same thing to both sides and everything will be cool. Right? So, yes, we will add two to both sides and we will divide by five. So as long as x is bigger than two, then this quantity will be bigger than eight. Yes. What? Are you talking about this? About what? this? Yeah. Okay. Yes? So the x is like the yeah, kind of. Like you're solving for x, you will get everything on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's like an equation, or it's like an equal sign in the way that you want, you want stuff on one side and stuff on the other side. It's also like, a, it's also like an equal sign in that it, it's saying something, it's making a sentence, it's saying x is greater than two. Like it's making a statement. A statement is, is like that word statement carries a lot of weight, has a lot of baggage. It means it's either true or it's false. Statements are true or false. If, if what you just said can't be true or false, it's kind of like, man, I mean, that's not a statement, right? But math is all about statements. This is saying that x is bigger than two, right? That's the truth. And if you violate that truth, then don't bring that that you want this to be true, okay? So as long as this number is bigger than two, this quantity will be bigger than eight. It'll be bigger than eight, okay? So as long as x is uh, three or 2.5 or uh, like a, a 2.00001, as long as it is even slightly bigger than two, this will be at least slightly bigger than eight. That's what we're saying. So let's talk about what Jacob was saying and, and what Connor was saying when we flip the sign. Let's talk about why. I really want to get at why. Because Jacob's inability to explain why you flip the inequality sign. I can't explain it, but it takes a while. Okay, so. Oh. Well, let's say negative x is bigger than 4. Like the simplest, one of the simplest examples I can think of where we have to invoke this rule. Negative x needs to be bigger than 4, then why do we divide by negative 1 and flip the sign? Right? It's a rule, it's a good rule. It will give us the right answer every time. But why? It seems magical. It seems like we gotta flip this, flip it. If we didn't flip equality signs, we didn't, it seems weird. We just flip it around? But we, we do, not because it's magical, but because the negative a real reason. sign can have holes in it. No, it's not. It's better than that. 
you're making it into, you're, 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 you're telling us the novelization of this story. It's not a novel, it's not a story, it's, a, it's just math. Danielle, did you have a way of explaining this? Oh, well, you raise your hand. And then you, yeah. all right, that's fine. Well, let's back it up. Let's try and show where like, okay, so yeah, I would have to flip this sign. Um, Let's, let's do it like, I think, a more basic way. Let's just continue to do the same thing on both sides of the inequality sign. Okay, agree? Let's do that. And we'll see how we'll wind up with this anyway, without having to do any sign flipping. Uh, let's add x to both sides. So what's on this side? Negative x plus x? Zero. Is greater than four plus x. 4x, 4 plus x. Subtract 4. Okay, and what do you got? You got x is on the smaller side and negative 4 is on the larger side. It's just a quicker way to do that. Yeah, it's like a quicker way of doing that. And also, let's, I'm going to graph. I'm going I'm to graph in a number line, but I'm not going to be graphing, like right now, I'm not going to be graphing what x is. We're going to act, and then I'm going to be graphing what this is supposed to be. Let's think about that. So, four. We want numbers that are bigger than four over here, right? Well, I want this side to be bigger than four. But the number that I actually want x to be is, is it, it, it gets the opposite is taken of that number, right? So, I want to choose values for x so that when I take the opposite of them, I get a number that's bigger than four. Well, what kind of x value would I have to choose? So let's say I wanted to wind up with 5. What kind of x would I have to choose to wind up with positive 5? Negative. Negative 5, right? So x is actually found over here, right? Where negative x is bigger than 4, x would need to be less than negative 4. Did I say that right? Yeah. Where negative x needs to be bigger than 4, x needs to be less than negative 4 because in order for the opposite of x to be bigger than 4, x itself have to come from, and this is true all the time, the mirror image of the stuff that you want to be. Like, if you want stuff that's bigger than 4, right, and if you're actually looking at a negative x, then you need the mirror image of all of that stuff, right? We want this stuff to be bigger than 4, so the actual values of x, which I'll do in green, would have to come from here, over there. Mirror image, flipping over, okay? That's kind of what's behind that flipping over. It's, it's on the right here, and it's correct. It makes it simpler when you draw the line. It, it matters like which way this is facing, and the x needs to be on the smaller side. But it doesn't matter if you just... No, the, it, this, this, same thing. It does make it simpler, though, if you're going to draw the line. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit it does. Um, okay. So that is explaining the rule. If we divide or multiply on both sides by a negative, not magical, we're just realizing that we need all the, if I want all this stuff, uh, but I'm talking about the opposite of something, and I want the opposite of something to be bigger than 4, then I actually need to take the mirror image and I need to flip over here. That's where my x's come from. Okay. All right. Let's talk about um, 2x plus 9 is less than also bigger than or equal to negative five. Let me say this a different way. A non-saving of ink way. If I ask you to solve this, you think you can handle that? Yeah. Yeah, subtract nine, divide by two. We got it. We don't have to flip the sign because we're not divided by a negative, right? Um, what about this one? If 2x plus 9 is less than 3 to 13, you can handle that. You can do that. What would you do to, to solve this one? Same thing. Minus 9 divided by 2. Same thing. Yeah, we'll just, we're, we're not pretending. Or, I mean, it is, that thing right there is both of these inequalities. It's just one of those and compound inequalities that we can just push together and say, hey, got it. So I can just pretend like, oh, I'm. 
Well, I'm solving this inequality. But I'm also solving this inequality. So I need to subtract 9. I'm just doing both of these at the same time. If I asked you to solve these at the same time, you'd wind up doing the exact same thing as that. You just subtract 9 there there. You'd also do the same thing. That'd be your same first step in solving this one. So negative 14 is less than or equal to 2x. It's less than or equal to uh, 4. Okay, and that's exactly what we would have here. We'd have 2x on the larger side, this is negative 14, and we have 4 on the larger side here, and 2x is there. We're just, we're just over here, we're just putting them together in that saving ink kind of way. So then we divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2. Negative 7 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2. So if x is between negative 7 and 2, or equal to 7 or 2, then 2x plus 9 will be in between negative 5 and 13. How would it look if we had not an and compound inequality, but an or? How would that go? We have to solve each separately. Yeah, it would just look like this, right? Because we, we can't say ink with an or. We can't put them together. We just have to solve them at the same time. Now let's talk about 2.8, the last section of, of chapter 2. solutions to this equation. The inputs and outputs of this function, what I just said, those are two equally true statements. Okay, they're, they're both the same as each other. Solutions to this equation, inputs and outputs of this function, it's the same thing. I want the x's and y's, and if I plug in those x's and y's, is true. This side's equal to that side. Okay. So let's graph it real quick. What, what would the graph of that look like? Y-intercept, go to x is 4, because that'll cancel out the denominator of 4, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. And that will give us a positive 1. Yeah, good. All right, so it's a line, right? That was the answer to my question. What is the, what does that graph look like? It looks like a line. Because we're not considering the other greater than part. We're just looking at the equal to part. Let's talk about any point that's on this line. I bet on this line is 8, comma, 4. Zero, what's that? Eight. Oh, three zero? I don't think so. I think yeah. my graph just is not. Yeah. Because if we plug in the x is three, we're going to get nine four, so now we have to find common denominator. It's not going to be exactly anything. Four one. Uh, four one. Uh, eight four. Eight four? Yeah. Okay, all these points are on the line. Let's talk about eight four. What significance? How is this significant to this equation? Yes? You got four. And you got four for y. You got four for y. Exactly right. If I plug in eight for x and four for y, that equation would be, would be true. Or another way to think of it as, as a function, if I plug in eight for x, I'll get out four for y. Okay? Well, what about this part of it? The y is greater than x minus 2. Like, you can see how this is both of these, like put together, working together as a unit. Okay. So this line has how many points on it? An infinite number. And every one of those points, when I look at the x and the y, what does it tell me about the equation? 
put in this x, you get out that y, or if I take the x and the y and I plug them into the equation, the equation will be true. It will be one side will be equal to the other, right? Okay, so if I choose this point, this x and this y will make both sides the same, yeah? But if I do that same thing, like I take 8, 4, and I put 8 here, if I put 8 in here, what will, I, what will it turn into? If I put an 8 into this, You'll get the number four right here, right? Eight. Put an eight, I get four. If I put four there, will this be true? Yes. No. no. Oh, it won't be greater than it, right? Four isn't greater than four. If I put an eight, I will get four on this side, right? This side will be four. That's why y is four, right? Because it equals four. But if I choose eight, four for this inequality part, that's not true, right? So let's stay on x is eight, like. Where will I find a point where x is 8, but when I plug 8 in here, y will be bigger than when I get here? Let's try, that's a long question. Let's try 8, comma, uh, 13. 8, comma, 13. When I plug 8 into here, what will this become? When I do all the math, what will this side be? 4, still 4, okay. What will this y be according to that point I just picked? Is that true? Yes, 13 is bigger than 4. 13 is bigger than 4. How about if I choose 8, 10? Will that work? How about 8, 4 and a half? So we're say shade everything above. Anything above, like all of these values, I could just kind of make a, like a vertical line, really, that, that shoots up, right? But isn't that the same for every point on the line? Yeah. Right? This point, when I plug in this x, I will get this, like, that y. Like, both sides will be the same. So if I don't want them to be the same, but I want y to be bigger, then what this x will give me? What do you say? Well, y is vertical, right? So I should choose all of the y values that are up, above, greater than, all of these. And since it's true for every point, all of the points that are above the line will be points that I'll plug in the x and the y, and the Y will be bigger than what I get when I play it. Right? Have a good day, everybody.